Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is game seven from the 2023 World Chess Championship match. Nyopom Nishi has the white pieces in this one, and we are level 3-3. Let's have a look. A new opening. French defense. First time Dinglerin is playing this in serious play in about a decade. Which variation? Tarash with knight d2. c5. Frequently when there's this tension, black will end up taking on an isolated d-pawn. Not the case in this game. How can that show up? Well, if takes, black takes with the e-pawn, and when these guys are exchanged, there you go. An isolated queen-pawn position. In this game, it's peace play. King-knight comes out. CD. Knight takes d. And more development. Tension is resolved. Black's recapturing with a piece. Okay, this guy needs to get out of the way in order for white to complete queenside development. So he goes to f3. Bishop e7, bishop c4. And with knight c6, black is saying, I'm okay taking on a somewhat fractured structure, a broken queenside. We get just that. And is this really going to be a problem? Not really. Uh, is this seen as a liability? Maybe only if black is inconvenienced, if white can put pressure on it and you have to babysit these pawns, but I'm not really seeing that to be the case. Eventually this pawn's going to move as a natural defender of the bishop. Maybe even in some lines there's some useful move by black with a major piece on the b file exerting pressure on b2 there might be a, a valuable temp tempo in some lines okay also with the pawn on c6 it's paving the way for the bishop to fianchetto now all right from here castles for both sides queen e2 bishop b7 and bishop to d3 so in this position already, black could consider going after a bishop. In the game, queen c7 is played, also with an eye on tracking down a bishop. Knight f4 is supported after this last move. Very natural square for the queen on this c7 post, off of the only open file. Prepared to put a rook there. And coordinates well with, the, with black's furthest advanced piece, we can say. Now, instead of queen c7, this is the other move that black could have considered here, going after the light square bishop. Now, if you try to save it, there's now f5, very committal, without question, to play in this way for black. You weaken both e6 and d5, and the continuation is something like this. We have some pawn sacrifice line where black is basically claiming, hey, I have the bishops. I have a, an unopposed light square, bishops that's, light square bishop that's staring right at the heart of your kingside structure. Some knight e5 is, can be met with bishop to d5, defending that f7 square. Okay, there is compensation. Bishop pair, wide open position. All right. In this game, it is queen c7. And now a transfer of the white queen to the king's side. We got a mate threat course that is spotted knight f6 queen h4 a lot of time right around this phase of the game after move 14 once this queen is assuming this aggressive post a lot of tactics are nearby a lot of time is invested by both sides a lot of time here spent on move 14 by dingler in he ends up going with c5 so during this time what was he maybe considering? Well, he has to have an answer to a couple questions. One, what am I doing after bishop f4? Well, we'll see what his response is to that. That's the move played in the game. But what he had to also calculate is, what am I doing exactly if the bishop goes to g5? Because there's a serious threat to knock out the defender of h7, to knock out the knight and then give checkmate. So what would Black's play be 
if the bishop went to g5. h6. And black had to work out that this sacrifice, which is considered the best for white at this stage, black had to work out that this is okay for him. It's considered a draw. After, let's say, c4, there's other moves that are draws, but it's basically saying now white has to go for a perpetual check. With this last move, black's trying to kick this bishop away from observing the h7 square. So the best here for white would be some perpetual, is what I'm getting at. Black has a good reply to bishop to g5. h6 is the move. In this game, it's bishop f4. And queen to b6. The human <laughs> reaction to this move right here. What is the computer reaction to this? The computer, I have to highlight a line or two with this one. It says, go back to the home square and be okay being opposite this rook for a move or two. Now, this is very hard for a human to play in this way, but I want to highlight some moves here. After rook a to d1, black can actually say, I'm okay if you go for this sacrifice on h7. It's not working. What's the line exactly? Well, if you take on f3, this would not be working, this trick to unleash the attack, because black is recapturing with the knight and saying, hey, you have a queen you have to worry about as well. So after, let's say, this, the computer says, have no fear. You could still stick around on the D file from the D5 post, and this is also not working because of this counterattack against the queen. So this is a very nice resource Black has available to him. And I should also mention, one of the ideas behind queen to D8 is to make sure this guy is still secure. Make sure that he is defended. Now, in the game, it's queen b6, and the reaction is to improve the knight. What is the continuation if white captures on h7? Isn't this a good idea? Isn't white winning a pawn? Not exactly. White doesn't bite on this tactic. Why is that? Well, after knight takes bishop, queen takes bishop. It's not defended. We could have bishop takes knight, pawn takes, and from here we could go after a pawn, the b2 pawn. That's like, that's the two-point pawn. Queen takes c5, there's rook f2, c8. So I believe even before we're at this point, Nishi shuts down his calculation and sees it you know, after bishop takes on f3, do I really want to take on this fractured king side structure? There's now no attack against the black king? No way. So, does not go after this tactical shot bishop takes h7, but it's still maybe in the air a move or two down the line. Let's see, knight e5, and now rook a to d8. There was a serious threat here. Knight to d7, if I'm to just make a passing move, that would be crushing, hitting the queen. And if she moves, we're taking the knight with check and giving next checkmate. So that is parried with the precise rook a to d8. And there is a big difference between which rook you move to this file. If you go with this rook instead, the move played in the game, rook a to d8, is the best move. A lot of time spent on that one. If you go with the other rook, there are tricks now on h7. Bishop takes h7, knight takes h7, queen takes e7. This is excellent for white, considered to be winning for white. Why is this? Or what is the difference between rook f to d8 and rook a to d8? Let's see. If you go for this trick after the move played in the game, rook a to d8, if you go for this trick now, how is it different with the rook still on f8? This is 
really, really clever. <laughs> Knight takes bishop, queen takes bishop, and we now have this idea as black. You ready? F6 with the idea to next play rook f7, and the queen is trapped. Now, it gets a little more deep from this point on, but this is one of the main ideas behind keeping the rook on f8. Okay, it says it's still equal after rook a to d1, and if you take the knight, you recapture. There's a problem on g7. It gets much, much deeper than this, but one of the points is that in this very position, if knight g6, there's rook f7, and black is winning all of a sudden. Okay, not, you know, not so easy to spot all of this, but that is one of the one of the lines I am sure Dingler in must have been calculating. You know, this is still on his radar, no doubt. Additionally, you know, when you when you bring this rook to d8, you always have to be on the lookout for possible sacrifices on f7. That all of a sudden becomes extra sensitive. Okay, in the end, it's rook on a going to d8. White follows up with rook on a to e1. Also, another important point here is instead of this move, the move played in the game, white has another move that they could go forward with. I said when the knight went to e5, he's ready to hop to d7 to hit the queen and the knight. Well, there's another angle you could strike the knight from, and that is the g4 square. So this is another really sharp variation right here. What exactly is black doing if knight g4 the apparent best is to sacrifice the exchange. This is really serious to capture the knight and give mate. So rook takes bishop, says that is best. And after the capture, you ready for this sequence? Knight d5, the queen is hit. If you block with the bishop, you're going to lose because f6 kicks you back. And then f5 hits both the knight in the queen. We're not done yet. <laughs> we don't have to go to g5. We could move the queen to g3. That is considered the best. That's considered the only move. And now comes Harry the H pawn. <laughs> Hitting the knight. Forcing it to e3. If some knight e5, there's bishop d6. Black is winning that. h4. Can't take. It is defended. If you take the knight in this position, the bishop is amazing. And the other continuation is to immediately react to this threat with queen g4. In the end, black swipes. The bishop ends up with the bishop pair versus the knight. And there is a severely compromised kingside structure for white. The light squares are broken. This guy right here is a moment away from being a nightmare, a battery, some kind of mate. This is where there is compensation for black. There is king safety issues for the white king. Okay, very computer-like line kicking off with rook takes bishop. Okay, in this game it's rook a to e1, g6. Bishop g5, rook d4, only move to address this pressure against f6. Trying something else, king to h6, you're asking for this kind of trouble, a check, maybe even a rook up and over, even a, an immediate skewer, knight g4, a lot of good continuations after king g7, that's a big lemon. The only move, rook d4. On board. Queen h3. With an eye on this square. Again, there could be some tricks on f7. From here, queen c7. Is there a trick and on this square if the rook leaves? Not exactly. It considers b3 the best continuation from here, but I want to highlight this possible sacrifice. It's not working. Now, during the live stream, I thought it would be, 
a good idea, but I overlooked a defensive move that Black had. I was totally missing a certain move by a Black Rook. So what is the idea here? Well, if you capture, again, after this move, instead of the move played in the game, if you try this sacrifice, it's not working because this right here looks very scary. Here's the defensive move. <laughs> Rook could go to g4, defending g6. It was a blind spot for me. And more than that, this is actually an aggressive move, ready to crash through on g2. We're giving white something to think about. Okay. These tricks are not quite working on f7, even if the rook leaves. In the game, queen c7, b3. Nearby, there was this idea to play c4, so that's ruled out. The bishop is now stable. Knight h5, offering a dark square bishop exchange. f4, white says, you take. I'll take on the doubled pawns, and thank you for the file. Black doesn't capture on g5. Instead, goes to d6. He could have. He could have captured on g5, and there's some interesting lines that come about from this exchange I'd like to highlight. Instead of bishop d6, if you're taking on g5, and then following up with knight to f4, Queen h6, there's one good move here for black. And that move is c4. It may be tempting in a position like this to say, whoa, I'm able to capture on g2 with the knight or the bishop. Well, neither is good. If you take with the bishop, we're going to end up with the two minor pieces versus the rook scenario. This is good for white. Not winning, but... White is, white is for choice, playing with these minor pieces in this position. The other way, taking first with the knight, this is losing for black because there's the tactical shot. Now that the knight is not on the f-file, there's a problem on f8. This f-pawn is pinned, so white would be able to smash through on g6. Take like this, take like that. We're looking at mate. You take the knight. You're going to get mated. So these captures on g2 in this position are no good. What is the point behind c4? This is a clearance sacrifice. It's clearing the way for what exactly? For queen c5. Setting up a discovered check. This gets even crazier. Knight g4 is all of a sudden an only move for white. And black has to follow up with f5, clearing the way to defend g7. Knight f6 takes, takes. The bishop falls. This is a really, really wild line. Apparently, it is equal. Okay, you probably need a good hour to work out that one line. <laughs> All right. Crazy, crazy variations in this game. That's one of them. That's just yet another one of them. All right. In this game, no bishop takes bishop. Bishop d6. c3. Black really doesn't have much choice. If you go here, you're going to get kicked with bishop to e4. And now where are you going? You'd have to go to d2, and it's not safe there. There would be bishop takes bishop, followed by f5. It's a problem here. So, black goes for this sequence. Series of exchanges. It's been a while since we had an exchange. Up until this move 22, only a pair of knights and a couple pawns have been exchanged. But now we get a series of exchanges. Knight takes f4. Bishop takes knight, rook takes bishop, rook takes rook, bishop takes knight. And after the smoke clears, where do we stand material-wise? It is a dark square bishop and pawn 
versus a rook in balance. Also, the clock times take note of them. They play a significant role in this game. Okay. First, rook to d8. This is indirectly defending h7. In the game bishop e4 is played, if you bite on h7, your queen is now overloaded, and black can take the bishop. Queen takes rook, king takes rook. Black is for choice. Black would be winning. Two bishops outweigh the rook. Okay, so no rook, rook takes pawn. Bishop e4. By this point, this is rock solid. There needs to be a shift in one's men mentality here. For quite a while, Nyapomnishi has been on the attack, but now there is no attack. This is an amazing guardian for the king's side, even if in some lines you crash through here. You kind of have to now shift and play some defense. The bishop on e5 is amazing, exerting pr pressure on c3 and h2. And this is going to require the white to babysit the c3 pawn. So some defense. He has to shift gears. No more attack. Bishop e4. You're biting on a rock. This guy is outweighing, by this point, the bishop on b7 outweighs the one on d3. So let's get them traded. Bishop e4. Bishop takes bishop. Rook 4 recaptures the bishop. If you're recapturing with the first rank rook, you're going to get hurt. Rook d1 will hit, and your king is flushed to f2. Not a good idea. This queen is still around. So it's the h4 rook that recaptures. And the h4 rook likes that h4 square. It goes right back. Now, why is this? Well, this guy right here continues to be a pest. This last move is saying, I don't want to budge with this bishop. I like that he's putting pressure here and here. How do you move the queen in this position as white? After rook to d5, what do you, what do, you do about the pressure on h2? Ideally, you want to, at this stage, play g3. You want to remain strong on the dark squares. This is white's way to tame the dark square bishop. But when you do that, you would be dropping, or if you did, if white played g3, drop c3. So we have a changing of the guard with rook h4. There's a threat here, maybe, and the rook also assists defending h2. Queen d6 maintains the battery here and forms yet another one along the d-file. Queen e3, the rook is defending h5, g3, critical moment right around here. Move 30, move 31, 32. Notice the clocks. They are about level. These are rough estimates. Bishop f6, rook c4 defending the pawn, reminding black that you may have to watch over c5 still. Don't go too far away. And now... Quite a bit of time spent on this next move. 31 by Dingler in about 10 minutes. He goes with h4. G takes h4. Not a whole lot of time spent on the recapture. And now about 6 minutes remaining. Move 32 also he spent a lot of time. He went with rook to d2. Now this isn't an exact amount of time remaining, but... We're right around this point, maybe about a minute left for Dingler in. Rook d2, eyeing up that h2 square. This is one of the points behind h4. You're pulling this pawn away. We have white taking away from the center. This is extending the scope of the queen. She's now hitting h2 directly instead of, h, instead of g3. So we're converging on this square. How is that defended? Rook to e2. And now best in this position with now very little time by Dingler in on his clock, best is rook d5. Getting back to this fifth rank, defending 
the c5 pawn. In the game, however, he goes to d3, attacking the queen. However, this is a big blunder. White can now successfully take on c5. Does he take on c5? He does. White is now winning all of a sudden in this time pressure phase of the game. We're not quite at time control. Meeting, you have to get to move 40. Again, no increment in this game, in this match, until move 60. The reply, rook d1, king g2, queen d3, rook f2, king g7. The king is... King does not have a good shelter with the pawns. They're no help. But the white pieces are guarding all the important checks. This being the main one. That's cut out, this intersection square. How do you get at the white king? You can't. In fact, it's white who's now on the attack. What's happening here? It's busted. Queen takes c3. It says three seconds for his clock. Again, a rough estimate. He really only had a few seconds to try and get to move 40. He ended up resigning after this last move. He made his move. Queen takes c3. Dingler in resigned. White wins. There's nothing to do here. It's completely hopeless position, completely hopeless, hopeless on the clock. If play continued, you simply exchange queens. He knew this was coming. Yuponishi had plenty of time to calculate. I don't even know if that's the right term to use at this point. You just trade queens. You know you're winning. After the queen trade, you s snap the F pawn off with check. Take A7. You have connected passers. You have everything. Huge material plus. So, another <laughs> win in this match. I have to mention, though, a couple points that were made in this press conference I found very instructive, uh, mostly by uh, Nyapomnishi. And that is, he mentioned in this position after queen takes c5, the best try, practically, was to go with bishop d4 check. Now, I found this really instructive. An interference move. If, if he played this move, white would have to have found a few only moves. Would he, would he have found them? We don't know, but this was a nice try. Let's see, what's the story with bishop d4 check? It is interfering with the rook's defense of f4. You can't take with the rook, that would hang the queen, and if you take with the pawn, now this queen has access to f4, but not just yet. Rook d1 check could be the follow-up. King g2 is the only move. Queen f4. And now the only move in this position for white is to play queen e5. Queen f1 check, king g3 only move, only legal move. Rook check here, rook e3. That's another only move by white. And apparently white is cool in this position finally. There's some follow-up checks like this. Eventually they run out. The white king is able to run away like this, but I thought it was cool that he pointed out bishop d4, a nice practical try, something that at least um, would have forced white to find some only moves. And one final point, he also said, Nyapomnishi said that he thought it would have been maybe a better idea for Dingler in to not have played this h4 move so soon, but instead focus on healthier moves like basically don't try to force the issue. Play a move like king g7. I think he used the word endless. You can make endless or several moves like rook f5, rook e5. You only have to meet move 40, make move 40, then you gain that hour, then go in for the, the more direct uh, concrete lines kicking off after h4. But I guess at the end of the day, it was poor time management. 
by Dingler in right around this phase of the game. I mean, move 31, spent three and a half minutes on that, and then basically the rest of his time on move 32, and there we go, move 33 was the big blunder. So time played a huge role in this game seven. So once again, Nyoponishi is back on top four to three. Okay, let's have a look at the tail of the tape on this one. Here we are. Very high quality game until the very end in that inbound state. Bishop in pawn versus rook. It was even liking Dingler in, but time gets the better of everybody and gets the best of everybody. Time pressure. Yeah, the only blunder right here. Rook to d3. And that's that. In the end, 96% accuracy for Nyponishi, 88 for Dingler in. Okay, we will see what happens in game eight. Tomorrow is a rest day. Feel free, as usual, to leave any feedback to this video in the comment section below. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe took a thing or two away. That's all for now. Take care. Bye.